I was at home on the day that I got the call. It was seven in the morning. The on-call superintendent was trying to get hold of me because there was a, a new investigation that I was going to have to take. It was a case of get yourself down to Twickenham with your team. A girl has been murdered by being battered on the head. It's a stranger attack, and we don't know an awful lot else at the moment. Was this someone? It could be a serial attacker who could go on to strike again. As it turned out, yes. This is someone with a real propensity of horrific violence to young women. The more I've seen of horrible things that happen in the world, and some of these things can happen to anyone. This was a high-profile job, and he was under some serious pressure. When he made a, when he made a decision, he stuck with his guns, you know? It's always absolutely crucial. You think about what you're doing in the first stages of an investigation. By 9 o'clock that morning, I was down at Twickenham Police Station. It was a crime of almost breathtaking callousness. The man who tried to kill her will never be free to harm The audio was too graphic to be broadcast. Colin Sutton was a detective chief inspector and senior investigating officer in the Metropolitan Police. He led the investigations into some of the most complex and high-profile cases ever, bringing dangerous criminals to justice. He showed his character. Then heard screaming. The night stalk pulls out the gun. Another 146 victims. In this series, he will take you inside those cases and show you how he caught these criminals using nothing but pure detective work. This is the real man now been found guilty on all the 29 of those charges. The oldest victim, 89. The officer in charge described it as a senseless the tragedy. The life sentence may provide some closure for these victims' families. At Twickenham Green on a summer's day, like we've seen, is normally a hive of activity, people enjoying themselves, this oasis of green in, in suburban London. But when I came here on a summer's day in 2004, it was because there'd been a murder. And when I arrived here, the whole green was cordoned off, taped off, preventing people using it at all. Twickenham Green is sort of a big triangular shaped piece of land with a path running through the middle of it and roads on, on all three sides. It's a cricket pitch with a cricket club and a pavilion and it's where families take their children, they walk their dogs. It's in a very safe, pleasant, quiet, corner of London. We were certainly not used to conducting murder investigations there. Arriving to take over that investigation, the first thing that struck me was the scale of the open space, the scale of the cordon. There was a woman who'd been murdered. There was a scenes of crime tent over there protecting where she'd been found. But we didn't know who she was, where she'd come from, how she got here. And that meant that this entire a swathe of green was potentially my crime scene. And trying to make a forensic examination, a fingertip search of that sort of area, takes a huge number of resources. It's always absolutely crucial what you're doing in the first stages of an investigation because decisions that are made then can have a profound effect on how the investigation goes. And you need to make sure, really, that you don't miss any chances to preserve evidence that you might want to come across later, you know, you might want to go back to later. Colin very quickly identified the fact that how, how important this, this, this evidence is going to be. If you make mistakes in the beginning, you're almost done. The first thing that I did was to get the scene widened so that we taped off the pavement as well, so that passers-by had to walk on the other side of the roads which meant they weren't able to put debris into, into the crime scene. It was really a question of getting officers from the search team to do a fine fingertip search around the immediate location of where the body was found to see if there was anything that, that would give us a clue as to who had done it and what had happened. The body was discovered at around about quarter past 10 in the evening when it was obviously dark here by a man who lived locally, went out for a quick walk around the green to get some air, and he saw what he thought at first was a, a bin bag or a, a bag of rags. It 
It's only when he went over and looked more closely, he realized it was the body of a woman dressed in white with a carrier bag nearby to her. And he found that she was still alive, she was still breathing. And he went away to get help and to raise the alarm. And police and the ambulance service turned up very quickly afterwards. And she was taken to the Kingston Hospital. And what the, the medical staff told us at the hospital was that the severity of her injury was such that she couldn't have been lying there very long. She survived minutes rather than hours. What you need to do is to try and find out more about your victim and find out the journey she had to get here, why she was here, where she lived, where she was going. That morning, we didn't know any of that. And it literally was a dead body in the middle of Twickenham Green. Let's get on and investigate it. And it's only as that day unfolded that we started to know more about the victim and more about what happened that night in August 2004 that we were able to prioritise our work and really start making some progress in the investigation. Nearby was a carrier bag and it had some clothing, some shopping in it. But also in that bag was a till receipt, but it had some phone numbers written on it with some names. And one of those names was Olivier. It turned out he was the boyfriend of, of the victim and he was able to tell them, yes, her name's Emily, Emily Delagrange. She lives just near Twickenham Green and that she worked as a, a waitress in a patisserie in, uh, in Richmond. I don't think I got home till past two o'clock the following morning. So it's been a long day as well, and, and it's a long day where I'm thinking, double thinking everything that I'm doing, because it's so important to get things right at the early stage. By the Saturday morning, we went back to Twickenham Police Station and we had a, what we like to refer to as a scrum down, basically a team meeting and briefing, and it's, you know, this is where the work's done. So I've got information coming in from my intelligence officers, from my inquiry officers, some in that case from the borough as well. And they're all feeding in and word was getting around that this was a, a young girl that had been just brutally murdered by a stranger. There was a, a kind of palpable fear in the community, but there was also a sense that they wanted to do something to help. I was part of the investigation into Amelie de la murder from the beginning. My role was known as receiver. The idea is you identify lines of inquiry that priorities very quickly. Lots of people would try to give information about what they thought might help. Our first crucial task that day was to try to plot the movements that Amelie had made on the evening before she was murdered. As is often the case, CCTV came to our assistance. It's very important to get CCTV recovery rolling really straight away because if you lose the footage, it's gone forever. The scene being in the middle of a green per se would not be covered by CCTV, but you can't get there without almost certainly being caught on CCTV. And, and Colin very quickly identified the fact that how, how important this, this this evidence is going to be. Emily had been at work at the French Patisserie in Richmond, and after work, she came here to Twickenham to meet some friends in a wine bar called Crystals over there. She had three or four glasses of wine, and while she's there, she phoned her boyfriend, but he was busy and couldn't meet up with her. So it got to about half past nine, and she thought, well, I'll call it a day. And she came across the road here and caught a bus back to Twickenham Green. It was on that bus that she missed her stop. And that was her fateful mistake, because if she'd have got off at the correct stop, she'd have had a short walk to home, and she would never have encountered her killer. The bus she got on goes towards the bus garage at Full, where it terminates. And that means it takes the, the southern road, the bottom road along Twickenham Green. So what she had to do was get off at the stop at Twickenham Green, walk across the green, and to her house, which is in Gould Road, which is a couple of streets north of the Green. She'd not gone off at Twickenham Green, and she was still on the bus when it got to the terminus at Fullwood Bus Garage. That's the bus stop at which she should have got off 
It's a short walk across the green and up to where she lived. For whatever reason, we don't know, she missed her stop. And instead, she's carried on for about a mile down Hampton Road until the bus garage at Fullwell. And when she gets there, the bus terminates, and she asked the driver when the next bus back up to the green would be. And he said about 10 minutes. And it was a nice summer's evening. You can imagine, Emily thought, well, I've got a decision. Do I wait 10 minutes for a bus, or shall I just walk the mile back? Fatefully for her, she decided to walk. And she's walked all the way back up Hampton Road. She'd have to go across Twickenham Green to get to her home. And all those buses at the Fullwood Bus Garage that time had just been fitted with, with CCTV cameras. And they had either six or eight cameras that were facing inside and outside, and they recorded onto a hard drive. It was all timed with the atomic clock. It was, you know, pretty much as good as you could get for CCTV in those days. So we've got CCTV pictures of Amelie getting on the bus, CCTV pictures of her talking to the bus driver and getting off the bus down at Fullwood. So it then became a question of going back up her walk up Hampton Road and seeing what opportunities for CCTV there might be there. There were three or four static CCTV cameras, one at the Lock Fine restaurant. There was an accountant that had CCTV as well. And indeed a, a police car, a traffic police car that had one of the Provida cameras running at the time. But also, of course, there were buses, other buses going up and down this road all the time, and they have their CCTV running. So by the time we were able to get all the bus CCTV, we were able to get a dozen or so points where we could fix this is where Emily was at that time. And we could plot her walk all the way back up to Twickenham Green. And it was only when she went onto the green that there was no more CCTV and she was found in the middle of the green. So we had kind of everything apart from the last 70 or 80 yards of her journey. What it showed us was that about five past 10 that evening, she came through this side of the pavilion. She'd have to walk across here, round the cricket wicket, and she would be over to where she lived. But we also know she was intercepted. We think that her attacker came onto the green from this side of the cricket pavilion followed her and it was when she was just beyond the cricket wicket that he attacked her, hitting her across the back of the head with something quite heavy and causing a fatal injury. One of the first things that needs to be done in the murder investigation is to make sure the next of kin are informed. It's more difficult when the, when the next of kin are abroad, as they were in this case. Amelie's parents lived in a, a little village called Anvoil in Picardy in France. We had a couple of French-speaking officers seconded to the team. They phoned our French colleagues and explained the situation to them. And essentially, at first, they said, well, 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 we'll get their phone number for you. You can phone them up. And we sort of said, well, no, that's not how we do it. We send somewhere around there. And they said, well, no, that's how we do it. When um, Colin found out that this was how they were going to be informed, he asked them not to phone and arranged for somebody to go round in person um, to speak to them, because he felt that that was a, a kinder, more humane way of informing somebody that their daughter had been killed, um, and in such an appalling way. Eventually, I kind of, it was, it was almost a veiled threat, really, but I said, well, I'm not going to have them phoned up and told about it. I, I, if we need to send somebody, then I'll get somebody from the British Embassy in Paris and see if they'll go around there and do it. And I think the, the prospect of me involving the, sort of, the, the diplomats in it might have had some effects, and the, the French police said, oh, OK, then we'll go around sort of grudgingly. I later found out, when speaking to Amelie's parents, that what indeed they'd done was they had gone around there uh, there were two detectives in a car parked on the drive. Amelie's father came home from work and they got out of the car and said, are you Monsieur Delagrange? And he said, yes. They said, oh, can you ring this number? Your daughter's been murdered in England. And they got in the car and drove off. Um, they didn't even go in the house, never even entered the house. The first time that police officers went into the Delagrange house about Amelie's murder was when I went over there to the funeral. So it's just a kind of an example of how 
priorities are different in different countries and things are done in different ways, I suppose. Even at that point, there was an awareness amongst all of us that this might not be the only one of these, that there had been other attacks where women had been hit on the back of the head by a stranger. It was, I suppose, the first feeling that this was going to be one of those cases where you had this element of pressure to succeed quickly, to try and protect other people. And I think we all realised that pretty early on, and, and so that probably added to the sombre atmosphere that there was. A little while into the investigation, I was made aware of another case, that of Kate Sheedian, in May 2004. Kate had been walking home, just got off a bus in Isleworth, but she'd seen this vehicle that she thought was lying in wait for her. Kate was 18 years old. She'd been to Twickenham Town Centre with some school friends to celebrate the last day of lessons before they all dispersed and took their A-levels. She got the bus back from Twickenham to home, getting off at that bus stop down there, and she then had a short 200-yard walk to her home. The suspect's vehicle, a white people carrier, had followed the bus. Kate was concerned about this particular vehicle, concerned enough to cross the road, try and get out of the way. She started walking along the pavement, and she saw ahead of her a white people carrier. It had blacked out windows, and she thought it was odd because the engine was running, but the lights were off. And she was intelligent enough to sense something might be wrong, and she'd heard stories of girls being dragged into cars and abducted and so forth. So to be on the safe side, she thought, I'll cross the road. So she crossed onto the pavement on this side and walked on this side until she got to this point here. When she was here, the people carrier suddenly lurched forward at speed, turned right and knocked her down. She fell to the ground. The front wheel of the people carrier went over her body and it stopped. And then it went backwards, reversed over her again, into the main road and drove away. His whole intent was, was truly horrendous to do that to that young person, probably uh, because she's a person way out of his, his reach. Kate suffered terrible injuries. Every one of her ribs was broken. Her liver was split in two. But she remained conscious throughout, and she managed to crawl a few yards, recovering her mobile phone, which she dropped during the incident. And she dialed her mother and told her mother, I'm here, I've been knocked over, I need help. And then dialed for 999 to get the police and the ambulance to come, showing the courage that she showed throughout this ordeal she suffered. Where does it hurt? Oh, my God. Yeah. Is the car stopped? Check me out. Yeah. Stop doing me again. She ran over you again. Yeah. She ran over you twice. Yeah. You ran over you twice. Yeah. And I really hurt. You can hear in her phone call how desperate that person is at that point. If you replace being hit on the head with being run over by a people carrier, that actually the profile of the victim, the location, the sort of blitz attack, everything was sort of similar. So I, I kept a real sort of open and undecided mind on whether that might be one of our cases as well. started on this investigation, I was aware of the Marsha McDonald murder. I knew Marsha had been murdered in Hampton, not too far away, more than a year, 18 months previously. And I also knew that that was investigated by another murder team, one from Hendon, and that they had a, what they considered to be a very good suspect who was arrested. So Marsha had been at the cinema in Kingston with some friends, and she got a 111 bus home here to Percy Road and it was about 20 past midnight when she arrived here at this bus stop. Marshall McDonald got off the bus, walked 
down the road turned right towards her home address. The suspect followed her, drove round the bus and pulled into the road behind her. We think he propositioned her and he got out of the car and struck her on the back of the head with a heavy object. And she sadly died from that injury. This was now the third case we were investigating, which involved a victim who had just been on a bus and was accosted near a bus stop. Marsha's murder was another big story for the media and a, a, a very worrying story, I think, for the population. Uh, there is no apparent explanation for why this would have happened other than it possibly being a serial attacker or someone that is striking at random. We know from other victims that have been hit over the head with a hammer from behind that there was no interaction. He just went up behind them and hit them over the head with a hammer. And Marsha's mother, having seen a picture of uh, Amelie the day after her murder, was very struck by the similarity in their appearances, as well as the similarity in the modus operandi, the, ma the method of their deaths. At that point, the investigation started to merge, and the police began to focus on the fact that there was possibly here a serial attacker. The Metropolitan Police said they were not linking it to Marsha's murder, and the reason for that was that they were looking at this other suspect who they felt murdered Marsha. On the night that Marsha was murdered, but before she was murdered, there was another young lady, 16-year-old girl, who reported being followed by a strange young man. But when you kind of looked at all the detail, the only thing he'd actually been identified for was for following this other girl. There was no real connection between him and, and Marsha McDonald. At the moment, they're two separate offences and we're going after Emily and we concentrate on Emily. You have to go with the most recent job because you're the best chance of getting the best evidence and then look at the others. But I was then told that there were other non-fatal attacks nearby. And because of the, the way that it works, whereby if you get attacked and you survive, your case is investigated by a couple of DCs, if you get attacked badly and you die, it's investigated by a murder team of 30-odd. And so the non-fatal attacks in the area had been left with the borough to deal with. And we were completely unaware of them on the murder team. One of the first cases we think that was linked to this uh, series was that of Anne-Marie René, who was attacked in Hospital Bridge Road in Witten in October 2001. This was an abduction or attempted abduction. A vehicle pulls up after Anne-Marie is walking away from a bus stop. The suspect grabs hold of her, tries to drag her towards the, the rear of the car. Anne-Marie screams, struggles, gets away, and fortunately for her, effectively the end of that particular attack. Adele Harbison had been walking in April, I think it was, in, in 2004, walking from a restaurant on the north side of Twickenham Green to go home and been hit over the head dropping all her shopping, falling flat on her face, smashing her face, needing reconstructive surgery. We didn't know that a lady called Dawn Brunton had been attacked in the same way out towards Hatton Cross, towards Heathrow Airport, on the 5th of November, 2003, sustaining head injuries to the back of her head where she was hit and facial injuries where she fell over. Irma Dragoshi, who was attacked in Longford Village on, in December 2003. Irma was an Albanian woman who lived in Hounslow with her husband. She was standing at a bus stop um, on her way home from work at about 10 o'clock at night when she was attacked randomly by a stranger who hit her over the head with a blunt instrument. And then Irma woke up in hospital with a huge um, injury to her head. She suffered I think very bad neck pain and back pain, very bad headaches. I know that she suffers a lot for quite a long time. There was another where Jesse Wilson was found with a wound on the back of her head and facial injuries, and it was thought that she'd fallen over in the snow. It wasn't even dealt with as a crime. The common thing of all these victims that survived is that they recall nothing at all of the attack. It's quite common that you will lose a portion of your recent memory. And it was only when Marsha was murdered 
reasonably close by four weeks later that Jess's case was looked at again and the pathologist that had done the post-mortem examination on Marsha McDonald looked at the photographs of the injuries that Jesse Wilson had and said, I think this is an assault, I think this is the same person that did that. Because of the lack of detail and CCTV recovery and, and lack of potential evidence, her case sat as a, as, a, as a probable rather than a definite because we were unable to prove it. My strategy very much was, let's stick with Emily for the moment. And the reason I said that was because it was the most recent offence. It hadn't ever been investigated by anybody else. If and when we find a suspect, then we can try and work backwards and sort of retrofit him to those other offences in the past. The next big piece of information that we had to consider was the service provider for Emily's mobile phone. They had been able to tell us that her phone was last on their network at 23 minutes past 10, and that that was in the vicinity of Walton Bridge. Now, Walton Bridge is six, eight miles away. We knew that she'd been found by the passerby getting on for quarter past 10. More interesting, perhaps, is the handshake. In simple terms, it's the phone saying, I'm here, have you got any calls for me? And the network says, no, it's all right, thank you, but we know where you are now. And what happened with Amelie's was that her phone was in the area of Walton on Thames Bridge, but it just suddenly disappeared. And that means one of sort of three things. It's either that the phone has been put into a place where there's no signal and stayed there, that the phone has been deliberately broken or had the battery removed to stop it functioning straight away. Or it could have been that it was thrown into water. And of course, we're talking about Walton Bridge, so there's a lot of water there because it's the River Thames. When we came down here, I wanted to try to find Amelie's phone and her other belongings from her handbag. So I had the police divers come exactly to this spot, doing a dive every 15 or 20 minutes, then resting and then going back down again. And it was remarkable. It was just the second dive that they made. A diver surfaces and shows us a key ring and a Sony Discman. Now, the Sony Discman is something that we knew Emily had in her handbag, but the keys were better because the keys had a fob on them which contained a photograph of Emily at a theme park on a log view. So we instantly knew that this set of keys must have been hers. And that really then confirmed the information that we had from the mobile phone company saying that whoever had killed Emily had brought her handbag and her belongings to this spot. The bridge here at Walton on Thames and this sort of public area aside it is an important location for a number of reasons. First, we had the cell site information from Emily's mobile phone company, which told us that the phone was last seen on the network. It was switched off or thrown into water. Uh, somewhere in this area. That had the effect of dictating to me the CCTV parameters. Every possible route from Twickenham Green to Walton Bridge that could be done by a car, that was the CCTV area. The mobile phone we never found. Of course, things are so variable with, with, with currents and sort of different surfaces and boats going past. It's not really surprising. We, we searched there for a good, good while, for, for I think over two or three days, but couldn't, uh, couldn't find it on the stretch of road. But didn't really need to. We had our keys. We had the mobile phone signal. We knew that's where things had gone straight after the murder. Normally in the investigation, most murder investigations we did, we'd have one sometimes two officers looking at CCTV. Such was the volume on, on this case that we had seven. And we gave them a dedicated room and got all the equipment that we could. One morning I went past there and one of them said, Governor, you, you need to come and see this. One of the most crucial parts of the CCTV was a bus camera that picked up a white van parked alongside the green. At almost exactly the time that Amelie must have been being murdered, there was a little white van parked just over there, the other side of the cricket pavilion. It was
was only there for less than eight minutes. And by going back to other CCTV earlier in the evening and slightly afterwards, they were able to reconstruct what that van had been doing. And it had been driving around and around Twickenham Green for 40 minutes. It looked like somebody was hunting. This van had first appeared in the Twickenham Green area just after 20 to 10. And they'd then plotted it and seen it on, I think it was 14 different occasions at various points around the green over the next three quarters of an hour. The CCTV team then spent hours trawling through the footage, identifying the white van from different angles, side views, back views, whatever they can get from whatever footage they've got. It did not include detail of the registration number, but it did give quite specific detail about the type. And, and luck was on our side to a degree because the van had a headlight that wasn't working. It had a wheel trim missing from the front near side wheel. And it had some sort of defects at the back, which made it easily identifiable on CCTV. Looking at the movements of the van and Amelie's movements together, we can be certain that at some point in Hampton Road, the van had passed her. And not only that, her pace slowed down there, as if she may have been stopped for a while. And that's why we think that what happened was that the driver of the van had seen her walking, had stopped and engaged her in conversation, and then, presumably when the proposition was declined, the van had carried on in front of her, parked up there, and the driver had lain in wait. And when he saw Amelie, very visible, even in the dark green, because she had all white clothing on. He came up behind her, stalked her round the cricket wicket, and then attacked her. The thing about Colin Sutton is he thinks outside the box. And there was one window of opportunity, and that was around the camera on the bus that had picked up the Ford Courier van around Twicken and Green at that precise time. The brilliant job by his team in terms of going through all the CCTV from the area. A painstaking job. We needed to find out who was in that van. Because even if it wasn't the murderer, and I had a good suspicion it probably was the murderer, but even if it weren't the murderer, it would be a potential witness. Some people above me thought I was, I should be uh, putting my time not on CCTV and vans, but on rounding up local sex offenders and the usual suspects. There's kind of a difference between theoretical investigation and what academia might say. There was no obvious physical sexual dimension to these attacks. A sociopath or a psychopath is someone who has no feelings about anyone whatsoever. He just went up behind them and hit them overhead with a hammer. To say that we should be looking at sex offenders to the exclusion of somebody who was there at the time just didn't make any sense to me. My immediate boss didn't agree with me. Some of my team may not have agreed with me, but it was my decision. That's what I got paid to do, was to make these decisions to strategize on the investigations. I went to the Ford Motor Company, and they, they were able to tell me from looking at the pictures and various features of it, that there were approximately 25,000 registered in the UK. We, we needed to be able to find the white Ford Courier vans that were being used in the Twickenham area. Nowadays, that would be easy because there's really reliable automatic number plate recognition cameras and software. We didn't have that. And so the only other way of doing it would be by human observation. The resources that were put in to try and find in that included evenings, night times in Twickenham, in and around Twickenham. And, I'm, and me personally, along with others, stood on a footbridge across the A316 in the kind of Twickenham Whitton area, looking for incoming vehicles going backwards and forwards along the, the A316. Had we seen any, we would have made, a, made contact with local officers and they would have stopped the vehicles there and then. I'd read a book about the Yorkshire Ripper, the investigation, and, and the, the investigation there had 50,000 vehicles to try to eliminate on tire tracks. And they started it and they had far worse kind of facilities and equipment than, than we had, because we had computers and things. They had, they had sheets of paper and people 
literally ruling cars out on their hands and knees on the floor with, with, with magic marker pens. And they gave up. They found it, they couldn't manage it, and they went on to pursue other lines of inquiry about halfway through. And if they'd have carried on, Peter Sutcliffe's Ford Corsair was in that group. We've got to have learned in the last 25 years that if you embark upon this sort of exercise, then you have to see it through. I remember the time thinking, this really is a needle in a haystack. You make your own luck. And Colin once described himself as being either, either a good detective or a lucky one, and you might argue you make your own luck. A number of us, myself included, were spending a couple of hours after work each day in Twickenham, around Twickenham Green, just driving around or sitting parked up, hoping to spot this white van. You know, there's no illusions that that was going to be extremely time consuming. And I think if it failed, it, somebody else would have taken this investigation off me. The point was made by Colin that he would put resources, whatever it took, to find that vehicle. And, that, and as it happened, it was us in the instant room, or me in the instant room, that identified the right one. Because of the nature of Amelie's death, the fact that such a terrible crime was so rare in that area, we'd had all sorts of help from the local community. Joe Collins gave some information about her ex-partner, said his name was Levi. She'd come across certain things, blonde women being photographs that were stabbed out. He was violent towards me. He's a misogynist. He hates blonde women particularly. He also would work doors and in nightclubs and things like that. That made him this kind of supposed character who could endear himself to young girls because he could encourage young girls to get into nightclubs. So they would look at him. But most of these girls were vulnerable. And very often, those young girls would soon be abused and, and damaged by him. He currently works as a wheel clamper and he uses a white van. This is an illegal car clamper who puts signs up after people have parked and then waits for vulnerable women to come back to their vehicle before confronting them with torrents of abuse, saying how much this person's going to have to pay to get that clamp off. And what that did was then trigger somebody else's memory who said, oh, hang on, when we were looking at the locally registered couriers, a garage said they'd sold one to a wheel clamper. So I wonder if that could be the same one. My brother Dave had been in the police a little, a little bit longer than me, and he had a number of connections through policing and personal life in around sort of Kingston, Richmond, Twickenham, where we grew up. Predominantly, my first role was in, the, in relation to the tracing of the, uh, the white van. Didn't have a registration number, just had a white van, which was quite distinctive, but not specifically distinct, distinctive because it was quite a blurred image. So. Each officer had actions to go out and trace white vans. Joanne Collins' information came back into the instant room. I reviewed that. In particular, the information about the wheel clamper then made me review this particular docket about this particular vehicle. The vehicle was the right type, but more importantly, it was sold by a dealer that both my brother, Dave Leach, and I knew. A guy called John Wren, who worked for Warren Motors. It was a man that I knew well. I had a relationship with John from way back. And this was a relationship just built on normal policing, you know, when you drop in for a cup of tea and you get a bit of knowledge, it was that type of relationship. As you can imagine, you're in the van business, you're dealing with some quite serious characters, and these particular characters that bought the van, a guy called Aaron Smith, who was a traveller, bought two vans from John. And one of them, this particular van, was being driven by Levi Belfield. I knew that there was a car clamping business, and I knew about a white van that had tickets against it, speeding tickets, parking tickets, that type of thing, that had come in from DVLC. I stressed straight away to my brother, I think we've got, we've got this guy called Levi. The dealer had seen the vehicle recently, and what he had seen is the back of the vehicle had changed. He said, uh, there's something distinctive about this white van, Dave. On the back of the van, low down on both doors, are welded two metal plates. Now, my memory of watching the CCTV was that there was something on the back of the van that stood out. You couldn't recognise it as metal plates initially. Unless you knew, you wouldn't actually say it was metal plates. But there was something distinctive about it, the glare and the camera. Then the other thing I'd noticed, he said, was that the, the glass panels in the back had been painted white. This made that vehicle in particular unique. And more importantly, it now matched exactly 
what was on a CCTV. So, uh, to my mind at that stage then, I knew that we were dealing with Levi Belfield. The van matched the description. Absolutely bang on. The research that goes into that vehicle straight away is, is enormous. Everywhere it's been, every camera it's done, speeding offences on the M25, bus lanes in Twickenham. We do an intelligence check on Levi Belfield then to see what is known about him. And he had relatively few previous convictions, but quite a lot of intelligence because he was always getting into scrapes and always getting stopped by police and doing things. And one of those scrapes was that in May 2004, he was arrested for abducting a pub landlord. And no charges were brought. He was never convicted of anything or indeed charged with it. But the important thing was that it said that he was arrested for abducting this man in a Toyota Previa. And I gave the registration number that was in this report to Tracy, one of our researchers, and said, can you check on the computer and see what colour this van is? Because if it's white, I think it could be something to do with Kate Sheedy. And she came back two minutes later and said, Governor, I think we've hit the jackpot. What we've then got is Levi Belfield involved with a white Ford Courier van of exactly the type that we know was 70 yards away when Amelie Delagrange was being murdered. And we know that Levi Belfield had a white Toyota Previa at exactly the time that such a vehicle ran over Kate Sheedy. From that moment onwards, we had our suspect. It's the 11th of November, 2004. I am looking through Levi Belfield's intelligence printout. And I see that in March 2002, he's shown on that as living at Collingwood Place in Morton on Thames. But I think, oh, well, if he's got connections in Morton on Thames, that's probably why he fled there after he murdered Amelie. Let's have a look where this place he used to live is. So I'm expecting this place to be close to the river, close to where the phone switched off. Instead, I find it's the other side of town, it's right by the railway station. But of course, I knew, hang on, that's exactly where Millie Dowler was abducted in 2002. There was a certain amount of interest from both the media, but also from the local people in Morton, as to whether or not there might be any connection between what we were doing and Millie Dowler. We had no reason to think that it was connected because you know, abducting and murdering a 13-year-old girl is, is a kind of very different kind of crime to randomly attacking adult women by hitting them on the back of the head. Millie was on her way home from school on the train, and instead of getting off at Hersham, she stayed on one extra stop to go and get some chips here at Walton on Thames with her friends. When she'd had the chips, she crossed over and was walking on this pavement. A friend of hers was at the bus stop behind me, and she saw Millie walk past the bus stop, but Millie couldn't get on the bus, she didn't have any money, so she was gonna to have to walk home. At that time, there was a building across the road with CCTV cameras on its corners, and they would have captured Millie if she'd walked past the building. However, they didn't. So what we know is that somewhere between that bus stop and this spot here, Millie Dowler was abducted. It wasn't until September 2002 that uh, Millie's body was found by two people going to pick mushrooms in uh, woods uh, near Yateley in Hampshire. Surrey police had been combing their county for six months almost to the day and not found Millie Dowler. It was here in Yateley Heath Woods in Hampshire, some 25 miles from where she was abducted, that she was eventually found there wasn't much to be told from Millie's body in the post-mortem examination. She'd been in the open for six months and there'd been certain animal activity. She was in the undergrowth. She hadn't been buried. She'd just been sort of lightly concealed. This was an area with which Belfield was very familiar. Just down the road, there's an arena where he accompanied his former partner, Johanna Collings, on many occasions when she brought her horses here to show jump. 
We still don't know to this day how she met her death. The only thing of which the pathologist could be certain was that she hadn't suffered a severe blow to the head in the manner of his other victims. Millie didn't die from being battered with a hammer. The most likely explanation is, I think, that she was strangled. But uh, there was a difference between a girl uh, being murdered in that fashion and a young woman who, early 20s, Amelie was 22, Marsha was 19. At that point, really, the investigation was no closer to finding out who did it than they were six months previously, the day after she went missing. Any murder case, no matter who it is, no matter where, that, what their background, you will work hard to get to the truth. We just get on with it, do what we're meant to do as thoroughly as we can. And if we do that, and we do that right, 99 times out of 100, we will solve it. I realised that Levi Belfield was far more complex a character than just somebody who hit women on the back of the head. Belfield was also a paedophile who sexually assaulted and abused young girls. And the more we got to know about Levi Belfield, the more appalling his lifestyle appeared. Belfield had a 16-year-old girlfriend in addition to his partner, Emma Mills. He had a flat in Hamworth, which was known as the Raping Room, where he and a group of vile individuals, some of whom worked with him on his wheel clamping business, would take young girls. But he was also into supplying drugs and selling drugs. He beats everybody he's ever lived with, every relationship he's, he's had, people who he could easily intimidate pay a pittance and exploit. One of these guys, Peter Rodriguez, that worked with him, Belfield exploits to such a degree, he not only stores drugs at the man's mother's flat while she's in hospital, but he gets his 16-year-old girlfriend to groom a 14-year-old that he then takes to that flat, gives drugs to her, and she's raped by him and his friends. Rodriguez had obviously put up an objection one day to Belfield's conduct. Belfield didn't like it. And as Rodriguez left the flat, Belfield carried out a hammer attack on him. Rodriguez, I think, died three times on the operating table. He spent a long time in, in uh, hospital, recovering from his injuries. When he finally came round, Rodriguez said, the last thing I remember before the lights went out, Levi Belfield was coming towards me with a mallet in his hand. Belfield had been arrested for that attack, but bailed because there wasn't sufficient evidence. This was six weeks before Amelie died. I was also mindful that we now knew who he was, and if he murdered somebody else, we needed to be in a position to say that we'd done what we could to keep the public of South West London safe. I genuinely believed he was such a danger to the public that the odds were that he was going to attack again and it was going to be soon. I really wanted to lock him up the day after we identified him. I'd have been happy to arrest him then. I was persuaded otherwise by some very senior officers in the Met who thought that we could put surveillance behind him. After kind of myself and my brother Dave joined the dots, if you like, between vehicle and suspect, we went into a, a surveillance stage where we were, um, you know, looking for further evidence against him. From my perspective, I don't think it changed anything. It didn't lead to any, any extra evidence. While we've got Belfield under surveillance, 24-7, team behind him, watching his every move. It's a Sunday afternoon. He's in Uxbridge in West London with a friend. There are two girls and they're waiting at a bus stop. Belfield drives past, sees them, gets out and engages in conversation with them. And the surveillance team are watching this, and they're so close to intervening on this because they don't like what's happening with these two young teenage girls. And then a bus comes, and the bus comes along, the girls get on it, and Belfield waves them off with a cheery, sort of abusive, calls them something. And they go away on the bus, he drives off. 
So the surveillance team do absolutely the right thing. They peel off one car, that follows the bus, the rest of them stay with Belfield. And when these two girls get off the bus, the police officers introduce themselves. And they said that he got out and asked them how old they were and they told him they were 14. And he said, oh, you're nice and young then, I like them young, and made suggestions too of that nature. So we've got here a man who preys on women who have just been on buses or at bus stops. Amy Delagrange, Kate Sheedy, Marshall McDonald, all just got off a bus. And here he is at a bus stop chatting up two 14-year-old girls and, and not chatting them up nicely, but, you know, they were 14-year-old girls and he's making suggestive sexual comments to them. Apart from the bus stop incident with the girls, was that somebody else came forward to us and said, my nanny was attacked near Twickenham Green a few years ago. We were able to trace that incident and, and verify it from the triage records at the local hospital, which said that a woman called Sonia Salvatierra, who was a, a Peruvian national, had gone in there reporting discomfort and, and a bit of a sore head from, from being knocked over and having her phone stolen. And we made contact in Peru with Sonia and she said, yeah, I remember the man. She described this man with a round face and a fat man and, and uh, no neck and all the things that sounded very much like Belfield. So to me, this was, going to be our kind of holding charge. I thought that would work. We, if we got, we could get Sonia back over here from Peru, put Belfield on an ID parade, she picks him out, we charge him with that serious assault, he's remanded in custody and that takes the pressure off. So that was the plan. We were going to arrest him, we could arrest him for Amelie's murder, attempting to murder Kate, and for an assault and robbery on Sonia Salvatierra. That was when we had the bombshell that the news of the world had found out that we had a man under surveillance and they were going to run with the story and two days before we had this huge plan in place to arrest him and Belfield would have wind of us. The best we could do was to try to negotiate with the news of the world and, and we negotiated that they would be able to send a reporter and a photographer along on the, the day of the arrest with the proviso they never printed it and never published the story until after the trial. I've never actually found out who leaked the story of the surveillance to them. But the two things I've been assured of is one, that it wasn't anybody from my team, and two, that it was nothing to do with any phone hacking. And the steer that I've had is that I should be looking at the higher floors at Scotland Yard. Once the decision is made to arrest, we were divided into two teams. The arrest team that went to uh, Belfield's address in West Drayton would have entered the house quickly and effected a, a search of the property and the surrounding sort of gardens, etc. Initially, they couldn't find him. He was nowhere to be seen. And then there was a, an identification via, via his partner, Emma, that he was uh, in the loft. It took them quite some time to find him hiding in his loft as he was, stark naked, and eventually brought him out. Colin then rang me at home. I remember the phone call. He said, I want you to do the following interviews with him over the next few days. So my reply to that was, boss, I, I'm not sure that's a great idea. In the greatest respect, I'm sure someone else could do it, but he was quite adamant. As much as he was a nice guy and very laid back, you know, when he made a decision, he meant it. He was very firm about it, and he said, no, I want you to do it, I want you to do the interview, and don't, don't worry about it. At first, he was talking to us and making denials, but he was represented by a solicitor that he knew that he'd asked for. And the difficulty came that when we started investigating him also for rape and abuse of his former partners, this solicitor had represented one of the partners in domestic violence proceedings, and so had a conflict of interest and had to withdraw. And the duty solicitor then took over, and the duty solicitor advised him to make no comment. And so for most of the hours of interviews that we did with Levi Belfield thereafter, 
he would say no comment. Too many similarities, Levi. Too many similarities for the question not to be asked and for you not to say why. No comment. No comment. Because you can't say anything, can you? No Nothing can justify it, can it? No to be honest, it, I'd seen that type of interview many, many times, and in those days, we got a lot of no comment interviews. We still have to cover a lot of questions. Why haven't you sat there and said, jumped up and down and shouted from the rooftops, you've got the wrong person? No comment. Because you can't say anything, can you? If they don't say something during the interview that they later rely on in court, then it becomes relevant or could become relevant for the jury. If you hit something he was really uncomfortable with and he knew he was, then he couldn't face it. He couldn't face you and he couldn't face what, 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 was, what was coming at him. The, the only time where he would really engage with us, we noticed, was if we showed him photographs or maps or some sort of document, then we could kind of elicit a response from him. I remember images being put in front of him um, in one session and him looking away, turning around, looking away from the interviewing team. He turned the photographs over. But when, you know, the second and third interviews are put in and the images are put there again and he tried the same tack, the interviewing officer would put them on the back. So as he turns the image over, the image is still there. It's not about playing tricks. It's about face up to what you've done. This is what you've done. Um, and he, and he, he obviously, it's not somebody who could do that. But he had this rather curious way of doing it where he would talk to us just every now and then and then realise he's meant not to be saying anything and say... No Sonia Salvatierra, the Peruvian nanny, was flown over from, uh, from Lima and she was taken to do an ID procedure and despite her confidently saying, yes, I could recognise him again, she didn't pick him out. And that was a major blow to me at the time because my confidence was high that she would pick him out in the ID parade. We could charge him with that assault and that would like be our holding charge to make sure he was in custody. We had the very real prospect of having to release him on bail. And such was the fear of him within the Metropolitan Police that there were arrangements in, in place if Belfield had been bailed he would have been followed by 24-7 surveillance until there was some reason to take him back into custody again. While Belfield was at Heathrow Police Station, I had two of my officers who, who were trained family liaison officers talking to his partner, Emma. It was clear that she had endured 10 years of a desperately oppressive, coercive and violent relationship with this man. But she was so frightened of him that she wouldn't do anything about it. He locks me in the house. He won't let me go out. Um, I can't have my own money. I can't have my own phone other than with his number in it. And then she talked about how often she'd been assaulted and sexually assaulted by him. And then told us, and I'm not the only one, because there are two other women who he's lived with in the past, and they will tell you that he did the same to them. If he was going to go to prison for a long time or forever, then this was her chance to escape. We had an awful lot of support from his, his ex-partners, in particular Emma and Joe. Joe gave us a really, really strong statement about some of the abuse she'd suffered at his hands, and that gave us a real strength of evidence to charge Belfield with a, a variety of offences, but in particular serious offences um, that would keep him in custody. And that provided us with nine charges, serious charges, that eventually were the kind of holding charges against Levi Belfield. Those nine offences on that indictment have never been tried before a court, never will be now. And it's a mark of the man and, and his kind of level of offending that something, an indictment that would be very, very serious in any other circumstances, has just been left on file because in the context of what else he's done, it is kind of not as important. There's no doubt that Levi Belfield was an intelligent man, not an educated man, but he was street smart. Where he made a mistake in the Amelie Delagrange case was at Twickenham Green. He didn't know that just weeks before he attacked Amelie, the bus garage at Fullwell had fitted CCTV to all his buses, which recorded onto hard drives rather than tape, 
Um, the, the time stamp on the footage was from the atomic clock. Each bus had either six or eight cameras facing inside and outside. Both of the roads, either side of Twickenham Green, have bus routes on them. And so in plotting what he was doing, cruising around hunting in his van, and plotting how Amelie had walked back up from the bus garage towards Twickenham Green, and putting the two together, and working out for certain that Belfield had passed her and probably stopped to speak to her, all this CCTV was invaluable. We're then able to spend real time and real resources bringing together the other offences that we think he's involved in. The first one was Kate Sheedy. It doesn't look quite right because it's slightly out of the area and the, the weapon is a car. So initially, we were working out, well, is it or isn't it potentially one of ours? I mean, Kate was able to explain that the vehicle that had hit her was some kind of people carrier and that it was white. Levi Belford, who at the time provably was driving a white Toyota Previa people carrier with blacked out windows, so a vehicle that fitted exactly the description that Kate Sheedy had given of the vehicle that ran her over. We went and retrieved that so we could examine it forensically. It had been professionally steam clean, valeted, top and bottom, inside and out. So there was no forensic material on there at all to, to associate it with Kate Sheedy. However, what it did have was a defective driver's mirror. And that was something that she had noted on the vehicle that ran her over. So it was you know, pretty likely we thought this was Belfield's vehicle. It fitted everything with Kate Sheedy. So I said, yes, OK, let's, we should take that on. And that was when we realised that there was a bag of CCTV tapes from a nearby pub that had never been looked at. And it was a simple error, human error, made by the original investigating team at, at Hounslow Borough. Although the CCTV had been recovered by the local police, they hadn't got the resources to view it in as much detail as us. Two lots of tapes had been seized because the offence was just near midnight and it was a bit confusing what day's tapes they needed. And somebody had viewed one but not realised there was a second bag. And when we opened that bag and put it in the machine, we could see the Toyota Previa driving, stalking the bus on which Kate Sheedy was riding. As the bus pulled in to let her off, the Previa overtakes it and parks in front of it. Well, what CCTV does is tell you exactly what it is, and it was a Toyota Previa. A Toyota Previa that was white, had unique features about it. We see the Previa going in the other direction, back past the pub on the CCTV. And we can't get a number play, it's dark and it's not particularly good quality footage, but what we can see is that there is a, a mark, uh, an irregular shape sort of stain by the petrol filler as the Previa drives away after the attack. And then I look at the photographs, the good quality photographs we've taken of the Previa we've seized, and there's that stain visible. And it, it kind of corresponded so much that we could get expert video analysis done to say, yes, that, that's the same vehicle. I realised immediately that had that CCTV been viewed immediately after Kate's assault, Levi Belfield's name would have come out of the initial inquiries. Just a few days before Kate was run over, uh, he was arrested for what he described as a prank where he'd kidnapped a pub landlord. It never went anywhere, but the intelligence report was there. So as soon as somebody saw that CCTV, somebody would have identified it as a Previa, a very distinctive vehicle. They'd go to the intelligence computer and Levi Belfield's name would have popped out. One other line of inquiry that we went down involved a mobile phone that was in the possession of Belfield's 16-year-old girlfriend. She and her 14-year-old sister were in the flat that Belfield had sort of illegally sub-rented from somebody else. And they were taking lots and lots of clips of themselves doing things uh, while they were getting drunk dancing and this sort of thing. At about one o'clock in the morning, Belfield comes into the flat and the girls take video of him. He's wearing an outdoor coat to jacket and what he does is he comes in and he finds a torch and he picks it up and he switched it on and you see his face illuminate he's kind of checking to see if he works switch it off again and goes out but the significance of this is that just 40 minutes before Kate Sheedy had been run over by 
a previa. And what this looked very much like was somebody coming in, getting a torch, because they wanted to go back out and check their vehicle over to see if there was any damage. It certainly showed that Belfield couldn't claim he was in the flat at the time it happened. The problem we've got is we know that the timestamp on the video is questionable. It depends on how the phone was set up. And there was some sound in the background, and it sounded like it was music. And somebody on the team said, that's not a pop song, that's a theme song. It's Wheel of Fortune. And so what we were then able to do was go back to that broadcaster and say, can you help us at all? And they were able to look at their records and give us a really accurate, you know, to the second time when they thought that that clip had been recorded. Now, we can't say for certain he'd have been charged with trying to murder Kate, but obviously there's a strong possibility he wouldn't have been free to murder Emily Delagrange. I know that Colin became quite close with Amélie de Lagrange's parents. He described them as being very humble and they were very respectful of the police and the investigation and understood that everyone was doing their best in awful circumstances for them. The only thing I thought I could do was to go and see Amélie's parents and apologise on behalf of my organisation, you know, my, my colleagues that, that had let them down. And it was obviously going to be a very personal and, and kind of emotional conversation, but nevertheless one that I knew had to be done. I explained all the situation about Kate, the situation with the CCTV. I said, look, you do understand what this means. You know, we should have had him in custody at some time before Amelie was murdered. And they said, yes, of course we understand that. We know that. Thank you for telling us. We thought you'd been honest with us all the way through this, and this proves to us that you are. What has happened has happened. We cannot change the past. It's sad. We'd like to change it, but we know we can't. Now, will you three come back for dinner with us tonight here? And, and that was it. You know, the, it was just the most unexpectedly generous but dignified and honourable, mature approach to what had happened. The next case to look at, really, was that of Marshall McDonnell. There was one line of inquiry which wasn't resolved, and yes, again, it was CCTV, and, and the bus on which Marsha had gone home and that she'd got off of just a couple of minutes before she was attacked. We looked at that, and from the outside camera, we could see that coming towards her was a car, two seconds after Marsha had gone through the doors to get off the bus. And then by using the inside cameras on the top deck but looking out through the windows we could see what that car did and what it did was it stopped slowed down and then stopped in the crossroads behind the bus and marsh is walking in that direction too but the important thing about it was was that from the front view we could almost see a number plate it was tantalizing we could almost see a few characters popping out of it but there was no doubt that the car was a Vauxhall Corsa. And one of his vehicles, one he actually bought on finance, was a silver Vauxhall Corsa. Trying to prove that that particular Corsa was his Vauxhall Corsa was very, very difficult. The combinations of numbers and letters on the number plate of this vehicle that could be seen and, and what the experts told us they might be initially gave us over 600,000 possible combinations. A lot of those possible registrations weren't on courses. They were completely different vehicles, so you could write all them off. And I, I said, as soon as we get it down to, to 200 or lower, then we can, we can go for it and we can start eliminating. And that's what we did, and it took us a little bit of time, but eventually we, we got those all eliminated. Look at the index of that silver Vauxhall Corsa, apply that to the Marshall McDonald case, and there he is. So you've now got three separate murderous attacks on young women, three vehicles involved, 
and each of those vehicles at the time is identical to one owned by Levi Belfield. There's an old, much used phrase that detectives don't like coincidences. And this certainly wasn't looking like coincidence. I was at a position where I thought we had a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to Levi Belfield, but that we could get more from his friends and acquaintances if first they thought he wasn't going to come and beat them up, in other words, that he was going to go to prison and not be able to, and secondly, if they understood just how much evidence we really had. And I came up with the idea of using the vehicle of the BBC Crime Watch, and I'd been on there with other cases a few times, and I knew the guy that was the editor, and I, I was just honest with him. I phoned him up and said, look, I want to come on for an appeal about the murders in southwest London, asking for information about two or three vehicles. What I need is for the public to understand that we know who was driving it. You know, we've got these vehicles, and we know these vehicles are involved, because that will make them realise that it's our man and, and come forward and give evidence. And so we went on to Crime Watch, and we showed these pictures of the Previa and the Corsa and the, and the white um, courier van, and suddenly witnesses started coming forward to us as a result of that. There's a man called Richard Hughes, who was more a friend of Levi's partner than Levi himself. He told us about him modifying the white van so that they couldn't be seen through and then cutting at the spy hole, and you know, he could sit in the back and spy out. He talked about a bloodstained shirt that Belfield had soon after the disappearance of, of Millie Dowler. Belfield said things shortly after Marsha's murder, for example, that you don't know what I've done, and, and things like this. So he was kind of a really important witness who'd been close to Belfield and was able to give us lots of little bits of information. There was Joe Ryan, who was another acquaintance of Belfield, had helped him out with some wheel clamping. He told us about Belfield hitting a curb with the front near side wheel. And because the van at that time had alloy wheels on, it damaged it so much that he had to put a steel black wheel on. And that was very visible in the CCTV. He also told us about the headlight and how the headlight bulb had gone on the near side and, and that Belfield had got some old headlights from a Ford Escort in his garden at the house. When we searched Belfield's house, we found this Ford Escort headlight with a bulb missing in the garden, so it kind of corroborated Joe Ryan's story. The other man that came forward that was really, really important as a result of this was a guy called Simon Redstone. He remembered cycling home about 10 o'clock, quarter past 10, the night Emily was murdered, and his statement said he was overtaken by a little white van being driven at crazy speed. And he kind of tried to memorise the number, and although he hadn't got it completely correct, he'd got enough digits accurately to show that it must have been Belfield's van he was talking about. And indeed, when we then went back to static CCTV from the Lock Fine restaurant in Hampton Road, we saw Belfield's van go past, and then a, sort of two frames later, there's Simon Redstone on his bike, so that corroborated that as well. We were now able to overlay the path that we knew Amelie had taken back from the bus garage to Twickenham Green with the movements of Belfield's white van. And what that showed was that as Amelie was walking back up Hampton Road towards Twickenham Green, Belfield at first was behind her. He came out of a side road, I think it was Fourth Cross Road, and turned left into Hampton Road. And the footage from cameras on buses show Amelie walking along and then the van being behind her. And then right up near the green, the sort of virtually the last footage we get, there's a change. And the van is 62 seconds ahead of Amelie. Amelie's on the pavement and the van has gone past 62 seconds, so a minute in front of her. But then when we look at Amelie's pace, she seems to have slowed down at that point. And that's exactly the time when the van would have overtaken her. So what we deduce from that is that she didn't actually slow down her walking. She was stationary for some while. And she was stationary because Levi Belfield was also stationary at that point, propositioning her from the window of his van. And that fits in what we think we know about why he committed these blitz attacks, that he would proposition a woman, she would decline, 
he would then be triggered by that and get out and assault them. So what we've now got is reliable evidence that Belfield had this white van. What we need then to do is to be able to prove that it was him driving it on the night Emily was murdered. One of the difficulties was that the scene itself on Twickenham Green, we had not been managed to get any forensic evidence, no weapons been found, the vehicle hadn't been recovered. Not for the only time in this investigation, Belfield's partner Emma came up trumps for us. Emma Mills remembered the night that Amelie Delagrange was murdered quite vividly. The plan was that he was to pick her up so she could go shopping in Tesco's. But he was late, he didn't turn up at home, so she phoned for a minicab and came here in that. When Belfield got home and found she wasn't there, he phoned her and asked her where she was, she explained, he said, I'll come up and meet you. And the important thing is that he came up to meet her in the white Ford Courier van. He drives to Hayes, goes and meets her in Tesco's, he takes the two older children across the road to Toys R Us. And there's a few phone calls between Belfield and Emma at that time. That's important because it gives us a timestamp and it gives us the fact that we know the number which of his mobile phones Belfield was using on that night. Emma then told us that they left here in the white Ford Courier van and went home to Little Bente, arriving there just after nine o'clock. She said Belfield had reversed on the drive, hadn't even got out of the van, left her to unload all the shopping and the three children. And as soon as the shopping's out of the van, Belfield drives off. And Emma tells us that it's about 10 past nine now. A short time after he'd driven off, she realised that she'd forgotten some milk and wanted to call him, see if he could bring some in. Looking at Belfield's mobile phone usage, when he knows he's going to commit a crime, he switched his phone off. He made a mistake on this occasion because that call from Emma to him about the milk hit his phone. And it only rang once, and then it went to voicemail. But that one ring meant that the call had hit the mast where his phone was, and that mast was the one that served Twickenham Green. So that story from Emma gave us Belfield in the white courier van with his own mobile phone in his hand and in the area of Twickenham Green. It was to be a crucial piece of evidence. And I can just imagine he's sitting in the van, he hears the phone ring and thinks, oh, I can turn it off and grabs it and pulls the battery or, or switches it off. But that one ring was enough to leave a trace on the local mast. We're kind of proving that he's the one who's driving the white van. The CPS asked us to just try and firm Emma's evidence up. She'd paid cash for her shopping, but what my officers did, and, and it was a fantastic and spontaneous piece of investigative work by them, they asked Emma to list what she'd bought. They came here to Tesco's, they asked the managers if they had the copy till rolls. They found her receipt, and of course it had a date and timestamp on it, and we'd proved that her story was correct. So that was a really crucial part of the evidence. In fact, it was the clinching part of the evidence as far as the Crown Prosecution Service were concerned. And, and it's when we managed to prove all that to their satisfaction that they authorised the murder charge in respect of Emily. It was back in November 2004 that when, when I first identified Levi Belfield, really, that I, I saw how close he lived to where Millie Dowler was last seen before she was abducted. In my phone, I still had the mobile number for Brian Marjoram, and he was the senior investigating officer for the Millie Dowler investigation in Surrey. And I told him all that we knew about Levi Belfield and where he was living at the time. And I'll never forget his reply. It was, the hairs on my neck are standing up, Colin. What I found surprising was that the kind of, there was a degree of inertia within Surrey Police in taking up Levi Belfield as their suspect. They didn't feel that they were in a position to drop everything they were doing and look at this man instead. What they sort of said was, we'll, we'll put him on the back burner and we'll carry on with what we're doing. And if that comes to nothing, we'll, we'll have a look at Belfield. Eventually what happened was that a new senior investigating officer took over in Surrey. I went down there with Joe Brunt. We had a, a meeting at Surrey headquarters and we, well, Colin put to them that we think Levi Belfield was a very good suspect in the case of Millie Dowler. We'd already muted it and been stonewalled about it, basically. They showed me a still from the CCTV. It's of a red car that they thought was a Mark II Voxel Astra. It was actually a Deu 
turning left out of the road that led to where Belfield's and Emma's flat was then. I kind of said, yeah, that's, that's Emma's car. That's the car he was driving that day. It's a Deu, and you know, it's, only, it's the only red one registered in the whole of Surrey. Uh, not a very common car at all. They just wouldn't want to listen. They didn't want to listen, and eventually Colin said, can I just ask, why don't you want to solve the case of Millie Dowler? At which point they erupted. Colin walked out of the room. With hindsight, it was obviously going to be a red rag to a bull to any investigator. I said, well, what I don't understand is why you don't want to solve this. And the reaction that I got was the reaction that comment deserved, which was, was, was sort of indignation. Uh, and it was quite forceful indignation by the superintendent. We established that in March 2002, Emma Mills, Levi Belfood's long-term partner, was living in this ground floor flat here. She'd moved there because of domestic violence at home. She'd split up with him, but he'd persuaded her to take him back. She wasn't at the time staying at the flat. She was house-sitting for a friend in West Drayton. But when Belfield came to that house on the evening that Millie was abducted, Emma knew that he'd been to the flat in Walton because he was wearing clothes. He'd changed his clothes, and she knew that the clothes he was wearing were from the wardrobe of the Walton flat. He also had the keys to this flat because he was driving Emma's red Dayu car, and the keys to the flat were on the same key ring. When Belfield drove that car from here, drove away, was Millie inside it? We don't know. We can't tell. 20 minutes after Millie Dowler was last seen to when her remains were found six months later, we have no idea of the timeline. We don't know what happened and in what order. All we can say is that Levi Belfield was exactly here on this spot at the time that she was abducted. We don't know whether he abducted her by force or whether he used his charm or his persuasion to get her to come with him. What we do know is that while Emma was away house-sitting for a friend, Belfield was using her flat as a base for his depraved activities. It was quite sad that there is this friction between police services, police forces, the Met versus... I mean, we should all be in, in it together and we should all be working for the same cause. And I, sometimes I didn't find it was, it was like that with other forces that we dealt with. It was you know, tragic, obviously, that they didn't find that clip with the Red Day with, and it took them quite a while to even acknowledge that. I think the real mistake was made where they visited Emma Mills's flat during that week when Minnie went missing, and there was no response from the flat. But it was a it was a loose end that wasn't sewn up. They were sending officers to reported sightings all over the country, and 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 yet didn't get the house to house inquiries completed nearby. The results and the consequences of that were tragic because from 2002 March 2002, the following year, Belfield killed Marsha. He left Kate Sheedy within an inch of death and then finally murdered Emily Delagrange. Later that evening, I'm at home, and my wife then worked for Surrey Police. She said, oh, the superintendent's asked for your phone number. My mobile went, and he says, do you know, I've had to think about what you said today, and yeah, you're right, we were on board with it. He's our number one now. Eighteen months after Emily Delagrange was murdered, in March 2006, we were finally able to charge Levi Belford with her murder. I read the charges out to him. He was charged that he'd murdered Emily Delagrange, that he'd attempted to murder Kate Sheedy, that he'd abducted Anne-Marie Rennie, and that he'd attempted to murder Irma Dragoshi. In May, 2006, he was charged with murdering Marshall McDonald. I was looking directly into his eyes. They were just cold black. He had no emotion, but I could tell he hated me at that moment, and, and I quite enjoyed being hated because he knew if he got convicted of those, he wouldn't see the light of day again.
But we knew at that point there's still a long way to go. You know in, in major crime that charging and getting somebody in custody is step, almost step one. From that point on, proving it, we had a lot of work to do to pull the offences together, join all the cases up and get enough of a case to make sure that he would get found guilty. The trial started on the 1st of October, but the first two weeks virtually were spent up choosing a jury where you don't have forensic evidence, where you haven't got a DNA profile or, or fingerprints or things like that there's always a chance that the jury will say, you haven't proved this. I'm somebody who's spent quite a lot of my life around courts, and to be honest, I quite enjoy the theater and the drama of a court trial. But this time, you know, the stakes were really high. This was something that I'd put a lot of time and effort into, all my team had put an awful lot of time and effort into. Emily Delagrange's parents were there for the entire trial. Other families were here as and when it was relevant to them. And also we had the victims whose cases we couldn't charge because there wasn't the evidence. But nevertheless, they came along. They wanted to see justice done. I guess the victims and the victims' families, the, 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 the thing that I would say overall to describe them is, is just the dignified way in which they conducted themselves throughout. And that was in stark contrast to the sneering and, and, and downright offensive way that Belfield sometimes conducted himself during that trial. He came across as sort of arrogant man who kind of swaggered his way into the dock. Belfield had little respect for anybody involved. He was not a likable character. He called Amelie Delagrange's parents scum. You know, how dare somebody like him, having done what he's done, call these dignified, wonderful people whose daughter he'd slain? How can he call them scum? He really still genuinely believed at that point that he would be able to talk his way out of this one, like he had virtually everything throughout his life. We knew that if this man were allowed back on the streets, he would offend again. The turning point came when Belfield was under cross-examination and he got a little bit kind of unsettled by this and eventually said, Look, I'm, you've got to understand, I'm fighting for my life here. And using those very words, as soon as he used them, I looked at the judge, I looked at the, the jury, and realised they were thinking the same as me, that you're saying you're fighting for your life, Belfield, but you never gave that chance to Amelie Delagrange, you never gave that chance to Marsha MacDonald. Why should we care that you're fighting for your life when you've taken some? Gradually, as he realised the, the strength of the evidence and the relentlessness of, of, of the questioning and the bringing up of these circumstances which showed what he'd done, you could virtually see in his face the realisation that it was going south, it, it wasn't going well for him. And I have to say, and perhaps it's wrong of me, but I loved it. I loved to watch him crumble like that. The day of the verdict, the courtroom was absolutely packed to the brim with press, police, and everyone who'd had anything to do with Belfield. And it's so nerve-wracking waiting for that sentence because you're thinking, this could go either way. It can, al it can always go either way, depending on the jury. The first verdict that came was on the Marsha McDonald case. And the foreman said, that by a majority verdict, it was guilty. And I remember saying to Joe, that was actually our weakest case. And if they've convicted him of that, he's gonna be convicted of the next two. And we sat there and we heard from that foreman that the words we'd wanted for so many months, that, that everything we'd done was, was worthwhile and, and Belfield was guilty. And we knew at that point the only thing that was going to happen to him was going to be a whole life tariff and he was going to be in prison forever. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's what he deserved and what we'd been working for. This was it. This was game over for him. His life was done. When we got that conviction, I think, most of us burst into tears because it was absolutely overwhelming, including Colin. Um, just absolutely overwhelming feeling. I don't believe that justice being served gives closure. 
I don't believe that families who have lost a loved one to murder ever have closure. The beginning of this year was most difficult. I was um, going through all the emotions of pain, back flashes, details, and of course, missing Marshall more than ever. Over this period of time, it's been hard to watch someone who's killed your daughter. But he was arrogant in court, and he acted as if he was above the law. All we've done for the families of the victims who have been murdered is the very best we could, and a very small part of helping them to go on and adjust and live their life afterwards. Of course, I will never be able to forget what happened to me. The scars on my body and the memories I have, I have are something I will never be rid of, but hopefully I can move on. Attending court and facing my attacker was very difficult, but something I felt was important. The court process has been a long and arduous one that has stirred up many unwelcome memories and a lot of evidence has been hard to listen to. But it is finally over and the fact that Belfield has been found guilty means more to me than I could possibly say. The life sentence may provide some closure for his victims' families, but the file on Levi Belfield is still open. The people we've really helped in Belfield's case by locking him away are the people who he would have assaulted and would have become his victims in the future, and they don't know it. But they're the ones we've really helped. Having been convicted of Amelie Marcia's murder and the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy, post-trial, the media were allowed to run the, the background on Levi Belfield. There were huge appeals to try and find the Red Dewey, which he undoubtedly used to transport M Millie's body. Another offence as part of the series was that of Rachel Cowles, who was subjected to a potential abduction on the 20th of March 2002. As it happens, was the day before Millie Dowler was abducted. Rachel Cowles' offence occurred in Shepparton. She was aged 11. Her mother reported it to the police. Not a great deal was done. There was the registration of the crime. But more importantly, three years later, when there's an appeal regarding a red vehicle related to Levi Belfield, Rachel's mother made the connection and contacted police again to flag up the fact that that vehicle almost certainly was the same one used in the offence against her daughter. That being the case, it made the incident against Rachel become particularly relevant. Because it showed that he was in that area, he was living in that block of flats where Millie was literally walking by when she vanished. Eventually, it ended up with Belfield standing trial for Millie's murder. We have some breaking news concerning Levi Belfield. He has been found guilty of the abduction and murder of Millie Dowler. Levi Belfield, uh, who is, of course, already convicted of two other murders, uh, is now convicted of the murder of Millie Dowler, which for many years uh, was one of the most notorious unsolved murders. He now officially, because he's convicted of a third murder, now becomes officially at least uh, a serial killer. It was the most difficult investigation I've ever done because it was so wide ranging and so complicated. And there's no doubt that of all the people I met in 30 years, he is the most dangerous was the most unpredictable and the most violent. He's the person I'm proudest of being able to play a part in taking out of circulation, because I seriously think that that's the most I could do for the community of London, was to put him away more than any other criminal that I ever dealt with. It wasn't an easy case. It was difficult to solve, and it had to be solved. As far as my career goes, it is undoubtedly a standout point, yes. Some people have described the Belfield case, the investigation, as an old-fashioned detective case. We had no forensic evidence. There were no fingerprints. There was no DNA. That's why we had to piece together this circumstantial case. And although the, the bedrock of that was CCTV and phone data, an awful lot of time was spent by my very talented and dedicated officers pacing around the streets, knocking on doors, taking statements, getting small pieces of information that we were able to assemble to make the case. 
Colin handled the case brilliantly. I mean, this was a high-profile job and he was under some serious pressure. I don't think, to be honest with you, I, you know, that anyone else could have done a better job, to be fair. Personally, I think there's other offending. I think there's other things wrapped around Levi Belfield that could come to light, given the right set of circumstances. I don't think it's a done deal if there's the opportunity and the resources and a set of circumstances exist. I think um, there could be further investigation work to carry on. The victims should be the most important people involved in the case, is my thought on it. So it's important that they remember they, they were the innocent people who, very unfortunately and sadly for their families, were hurt by him. During that inquiry, which lasted four years, I met a lot of people of whom family members, friends, some of whom I'm still friends with today. Standing there at the Old Bailey at that conviction was the highlight of my career. I've no doubt that at some point, if, if, if I'm fortunate enough to outlive him, that somebody will come to me and say, what are your comments? And, you know, I won't mourn Levi Belford. I think very few people will.